Yes, I'm, I'm here talking on behalf of the um, Joint Board Council Committee on Publications. And so I know some of you are ACS, but who here has ever heard of the Joint Board Council Committee on Publications? <laughs> Who's the current chair? The current chair is Kevin Gable. Okay. Um, so you're probably, you know, in this ethics um, symposium, you're probably wondering, what is this committee? Um, why is this are, you guy, still, are you still on the committee? I'm still on the committee. Um, why is this guy talking about this in this ethics, um, publishing ethics um, symposium? And what does this committee do? And so I'm hoping to answer those questions for you and more uh, today. And you'll note that I've handed out, or had Grace pass out the ACS ethical guidelines to publication of chemical research, um, which we've learned that people aren't don't pay attention to. <laughs> But uh, also note that it had a publication date of August 2010, at least the current, current version of it. And so maybe people will become more aware of it as time progresses. So the ACS actually has two committees focused on publishing. And uh, they, have, they focus on different aspects of publishing. One is the governing board for publishing. And their charge really is the business operations. They're interested, in, you know, they look at the pricing and the marketing and and uh, things of that nature. They also look at the business opportunities with regard to, to uh, whether new titles should be launched, things of that sort. The Joint Board um, Council Committee on Publications, uh, its focus is on editorial quality. Uh, it, it, and, and I'll get into more detail about what I, mean, what I mean by that and what the role is, how we go about doing that. But we're focused on, on the content. We're focused on um, the editors, we're focused on the, the process, um, and, and so on. And in fact, the responsibilities of the committee are to assess the editorial quality and content of the publication program. Uh, we actually serve as a communication channel among all the stakeholders within society, within, within the, the communities that are served by the publications. We work with the editors um, concerning editorial policy. Um, we, we uh, participate in the edit, at least the chairs. Per, the chair participates in the editors' conference, which is held every year, where they, they communicate about um, common issues. Uh, this committee actually reviews the editors in chief and recommends whether they should be reappointed or not to the board of directors, because the editors in chief of ACS Publications actually are in a term appointment, and it's a check in. Basically, we're a check and balance um, for of the members on. On the, on the journals and the editors. Um, we also recommend to the board of directors whether there should be changes in the publications. Let's say that, that uh, in, in, from past experiences, uh, whether two, two journals should be merged, content-wise, you know, as, as an example. We also have a subcommittee on copyright, and we all advise on matters related to copyright. So that, that's what the charges are. Those are the, the general responsibilities of this particular committee. And so I think you're beginning to get a picture for why we're giving a talk in an ethics uh, symposium. So functionally, what do we do? The committee meets twice per year at the ACS symposium. Uh, we regularly monitor the individual journals. Uh, some of these dossiers that are pulled together, in, what we're interested in is doing a health assessment, assessment or if you've ever been in the military, of uh, uh, fitness um, evaluation, okay? Uh, how we pass questions, general questions of how well is the journal meeting its mission and serving its community? Um, how well is the editorial operation functioning? Are things being done in a timely way? Um, is are, are the are the um, are, is the, the journal perceived as being fair? I mean, we consider factors that include bibliometric, statistical, and competitive landscape analysis. The dossiers that are provided or that are generated by staff at the request of, of the committee often are um, a quarter of an inch to, to a half an inch thick of paper. Every way you can slice and dice the journal. Uh, we, and we delve into them, we read them, and there, there are critical evaluations that are done. There's input from the editors with regard to their vision. Um, we get all of the bibliometric, all, all of the statistical information with regard to when, um, how long it takes for papers from the month they are received to when they are published and the review process and, and so on. Um, we evaluate the editor and editorial team composition and quality. Uh, are they are they um, representative of the community that it's be, that is being served? Uh, we also seek assessment from 
with experts. We reach out and we query experts in that particular sub-discipline in chemistry. Uh, we, we um, many of the journals, I mean, the journals are tied to specific research communities. The, um, there are a lot of divisions of the ACS that are tied to specific research communities. So we reach out to the divisions and seek input with regard to who, what experts we should query. We also ask the editors. And we, and we have composition on the, on the, on the um, committee that also provides input into this process. It, it's limited in its focus, but that's so that we have a, a, a good quality um, input. And, and those, those responses to a very short survey, I should mention, I, I looked at the number of questions you had and, and, uh, in, in an earlier talk, and, and that's not what we did. We, we have about a dozen questions, and they're fairly open-ended, and in a way where we actually encourage essays. And that, and, and that turns out to be very insightful for us. Sometimes if people don't respond after we're doing it, that's also informative to us. Especially once we touch them once or two times, one or, once or twice um, in order to respond. We also engage in an evaluation of the editor-in-chief. We look at the ed editor's performance as an editor. We look to see whether they are research active. That is a requirement, a fundamental requirement of an ACS editor editor-in-chief and associate editor. They must be research active. Um, and whether their activity is relevant to the journal. I, mean, I it, it seems like I shouldn't have to specify that, but that's important. Um, we also look at, and we query, we have a series of questions that we ask, open-ended questions, with regard to the what the critical analysis, the SWOT analysis of the journal by the editor-in-chief, as well as what their vision and plans are for the journal. And this speaks legions too. If we get one liners to the, to the series of questions, that tells us something. If we get paragraphs and they're insightful, that tells us something. And, and through this whole process, we end up making recommendations to the board of directors with regard to whether an editor should be reappointed or not. Now, with regard to associate editors and so on, that's the prerogative of the editor in chief. We trust a lot in the editor in chief. Our level of um, oversight is with the editorial operations, the, edit, uh, the overall of the journal, and with the editor-in-chief. And also, when it comes time to look for editors for a journal, members of the committee, but not all of them, because we get the community that is served by that, that publication, the members of, of the um, Joint Board Council of Committee on Publications also serve on editor-in-chief search committees. To, one thing to point out, though, is that while we have all of this review process, there are some fundamentals with regard to how editorial operations function in, in the ACS. And the one is, and, and this is, you know, there, there are some ACS constitution, there's ACS bylaws, and there are ACS regulations. Okay, those are three governing documents. And in the ACS regulations, section 8.2a and c speak to to a fundamental, and that is that the editor-in-chief, or the editors, retain final responsibility for editorial decisions in the journals um, relative to their publications. No attempt should be made, and there's a long laundry list, actually, it's a similar list to the one down here, should be made by these folks to instruct editors in the day-to-day -day function of the journal. We don't do, that's the editor-in-chief's job. Now, we have ACS staff that support and certainly that they guide the portfolio and, we, and work with the editors with regard to policy. But in the end, that editor-in-chief is responsible for those decisions, but yet they are held accountable to the Joint Board of Council Committee on Publications and the Board of Directors. Okay. The editors of the Society of Primary Publications also enjoy freedom with respect to the exercise of editorial prerogatives insofar as they pertain to scientific content of published articles. Again, the technical content they have been highly select, have vetted and selected with regard to being on um, tops of the field. And we entrusted them um, the, the obligation or the responsibility with regard to what that content is. And we take this very seriously. We recognize that ACS publications are the permanent record of our discipline. And, and you know, it's an awesome responsibility that they have. Um, the editor shall not be subject to or obligated to accept it. Recommendations or instructions from from people making 
be influenced, unduly influenced by people with authority within the organization, even though there is a check and balance process. Um, and that's particularly with regard to selection of articles, publication, or the contents thereof. So the president can't call up Paul and say, hey, I have a, I have a, I, a colleague of mine has a great paper, and I really want you to make sure you have that published. Can't do that. Um, there's, that's an integrity issue. So I just handed out the ethical guidelines for publication, and, and it covers a variety of things. There's a little preface giving you, you know, the, the preamble for, for why this is important. Um, it specifies ethical obligations for editors of the journals, for the authors, for reviewers, uh, um, authors publishing outside of scientific let literature, and so on. You can find it at this website, and you also have a print copy now. And there's also another, there's another organization which was, which was um, alluded to earlier today, um, which is publicationsethics.org, which actually um, provides flow diagrams for how to deal with ethical issues with regard to, to um, that they can arise within a journal or a publication. So I bring that to your attention because there are a couple of things I want to highlight uh, from the first three bullets of, of, of the um, part about editors, and that is an editor should give unbiased consideration to all manuscripts offered for publication, judging each on its merits. And this is basically 14th Amendment type of stuff below here with regard to, you know, you, you just can't be biased in what you're doing. The other is that an editor should consider manuscripts submitted for publication with all reasonable speed. Don't sit on. And again, within this, it underscores the sole responsibility for acceptance or rejection of manuscript rests with the editor. They're not just a file clerk. Okay, and I make that point in that they are to seek advice of reviewers, but they may reject with Without external review, and we heard this from you know earlier today that the editor himself is a referee. They were selected because of their technical expertise and the subject matter of that journal. They are the primary referee, if you will. Okay, so they can make that decision. So, what is the role of this committee that that I'm talking about? We serve as a check and balance for potential, editor, among all the other things, potential editor ethical misconduct. It's important for the community to know. I mean, ACS has this tagline, ACS Publications, most trusted, most read, most cited. And most trusted, we're part of the trust factor there. And we are member representatives to ensure the trust of that, that has been placed in this permanent record. And those who are are at the moment the caretakers of it, that they are doing an ethical job. We also oversee editorial operations, and this committee with ACS staff does investigate alleged editorial misconduct. We don't do it often, thankfully, but we do do it. So, since Disneyland's the place where imagination is the destination, Let's use our imagination now and, and look at two fictional case studies. And so I'm going to, I want audience participation here. <laughs> so, case number one is editor conflict of interest. So Dr. Mickey Moose, not mouse, Moose, submits a paper to Journal A with, a game, with game changing findings. It's accepted with minor revisions after an unusually long review process. And before his paper appears online, a related paper, I, I'm sorry I'm reading this, but I, it, a related paper is published that was submitted to, the jur to another journal, I'm sorry about the title, after his. It wasn't to, to Journal A, it was to a journal. A co-author of a related <coughs> paper, of the, that related paper, is the associate editor who handled his manuscript. Mickey, as you can imagine, is upset. Um, and he alerts the editor-in-chief of Journal A and the Joint Board Council Chair of his potential conflict of interest. So, I put to you, how should this case be handled? Because this is a, this is a composite and, you know, a fictional case, but it's the kind of thing that we would have to deal with. So, I, I see a hand moving in the back. How, oh, no. no. How, how should we handle that? Yes. 
course, you want to find out uh, uh, about the. You have to get details on the length of the review process, whether or not this co-author, in fact, saw the manuscript. Right. So first, do we have jurisdiction? That's my first question. The, does the community have jurisdiction? Yeah. Yes. And, and, and I guess that was presumed, but, but that's the first question that we ask ourselves. Is this something that we can get involved in? Okay. okay. Because it is an associate editor. Okay, so according to what you're saying here, the associate editor had handled this manuscript before. The associate editor received Mickey's paper, the and, and it was a long review process, and before Mickey's paper appears online, kind of data. A, a similar paper appears that was submitted after Mickey's and, and appears in another journal before Mickey's comes out. But the associate editor is acting as the agent of, AC, of ACS or whatever. Right. Whatever. So, so, so we have jurisdiction, and, and your comment that we need to see whether whether they're substantively the same or not, and, and, and any other comments? So, so wouldn't JVCCP contact the editor-in-chief and ask them, make them aware of the situation and work with them and, uh, and have the editor-in-chief document the sequence of events and then present to JVCCP? Right. And as opposed to kind of stepping in and taking over. Um, and, and in fact, Mickey contacted the editor-in-chief and the, the committee in this, in this uh, illustration. Well, so somebody has to speak to this associate editor. That's right. And and in the end, perhaps it's the editor in chief. Why would Mickey also include this chair in this? Why why do you think Mickey did that? Because you're responsible for the editors. But if you're responsible for the editor in chief, the editor in chief is responsible for the associate editor. Right. Perhaps he was doing that to make sure that the editor in chief acted. Because we serve as an independent body. Active fair. An active fair. And with oversight. Okay. So I belabored that a bit. Here are a couple of things that I jotted down. And again, this is from Composite. Mickey's paper was accepted and published, but there is an apparent conflict of interest with the associate editor. The EIC with ACS staff assistance should, in my opinion, should look into the matter and address the author's concern. While contacting the chair comforts me that the case will be given a fair look. It wasn't necessary, but it was a good thing to do. Okay. The two papers, as you mentioned, should be compared by the editor-in-chief and the ACS staff. I don't necessarily as a chair need to see this, but there needs to be an independent look at whether, whether in particular, because of the timeline of the review, at the timeline of the review process, it should be investigated and why investigate why there were delays and what could have been done about that. You know, sometimes it's just because reviewers are just so darn slow. Okay. Now, I mentioned that all ACS editors are research active. That in itself, because of subject matter, can provide a conflict of interest. But so perhaps one of the outcomes of this would be that the journal policy should be revised to have an associate editor hand work that is identical to theirs to another associate, or the editor in chief should do that particular thing to avoid an apparent conflict of interest. I mean, we do see. First of all, you do want someone who's an expert in the area to be handling the paper, but we do have a choice of editors identi you know, identify this right. is too close and it's like somebody else or Right. You know. And I said this and is a fictional like, case, but it, right. but no, it's absolutely it comes up very frequently where yeah. someone says, I'm in this area of the, you know, you're, you're often more often the uh, authors ask for an editor who has a conflict of interest for them. Right. And often referees too. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, they're asking his mother or anyone else to review the paper. But this, you know, you want expertise, president, right. you just have to. You have to and see, and you have to count on your associate editors to, to say when there's going to be a problem. And right. That, that's the key. But this is, because yeah. Because you can't always know the work that an associate may have just started doing and then published. Yeah. It's up to the associated to recognize and it, and what's the accuse yes. him or herself. Right. Right. And, and likewise in this I'll investigation. If I take the assignment, it goes to that associate editor and the author's notified. And if it comes back and goes to the new associate editor, the author's notified of that too. Right. So even if it passes through the office, you try and make sure the authors know who's seen the who's seen the paper. Right. It just I mean it's partly for this reason, partly so they know right. you know, when 
And one thing I didn't mention in this is that all parties involved need to declare whether there's conflict of interest. Let's say editor-in-chief is best pals with Mickey. Should editor-in-chief be doing this, this investigation? No, it needs to be handed off. And, 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 and you know those kinds of things. And so that's what, in combination with the, and, and if, the, if the chair is best friends with Mickey, it needs to be handed off. So there are all of those things need to be done. And I can tell you that that kind of thing is how we operate when we get cases that would be related to this. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things that comes up anytime there's any conflict is that the journals have no ability to investigate anything, right? Some two people at some institution will say overseas, say, this guy stole my idea of group meeting and then published it. And I want you to do something about it. We had a number of different emails in one particular case, not just to our journal, but to it. Yeah. But just one that just this continuing barrage, and all you can do is, you know, when they want the full, you know, CSI treatment of every lab notebook in a country where, you know, and we, can't we do don't even visit. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so having some some staff set up with some experience, actually. So I have a question for you and the staff. What's the, what's the requirement for whistleblower identification? The reason I ask that is uh, a colleague contacted me some time ago wanted, and had contacted you all, maybe the director of publications, the staff director, of, uh, anonymously. And, it's, and the person said, we will accept uh, information from a whistleblower only if they are willing to provide their name on a confidential basis. And this individual felt, said to me, he, she was unwilling to do that because he, she was unwilling to trust ACS with that information. That is, he wanted to give the whistleblower information but was unwilling to give his name. And, and, and felt, his or her position was, that the information he or she would provide did not require his or her testimony was information in order to. Do you, could you both tell me whether whistleblower identification is required to pass on that information? I don't have an answer for you. I'd have to come back to you with giving you what the okay. official policy Maybe is on that. Anything I would say would just be okay. me Fair speaking enough. off the top of what, what about NSF? NSF OIG will accept and investigate anonymous allegations. There, there are anonymous hotline, there's an anonymous email. Sometimes those don't go very far because you don't get the relevant information. That's fair enough. If they don't provide, they don't provide it. Point two, the identity of a person that we do know about will be kept confidential. There's part two A, if they request confidential source, that puts a whole other layer of protection on it, but part B is they're kept confidential except in very limited circumstances otherwise. Step three, there is no federal whistleblower protection for allegations. There's federal whistleblower protection for federal employees, but there is no federal whistleblower protection for people who talk about misconduct with respect to NSF funds, except, sorry, it's the government, except for ERA funds, A-R-R-A -R -R -A funds. The ERA funds, the ERA law passed through Congress provides specific whistleblower protection to people who make allegations of fraud with respect to the expenditure of ERA funds. <laughs> so when you call us up, the first question we ask, and people say, that's a stupid question, but it's not, is, is this related to ERA funds? Because if it is, we can tell you something right away. If you don't know, we can't tell you. But there, there's a difference. And it's been a good discussion. I want to go on yeah. to the next case study. Right. So arbitrary rejection. And, and the reason why I gave you all of that, the, the legalese in the preamble is to give you some context of how we go about making a decision. So, so Dr. Donald Duncan has, has a paper rejected by the editor-in-chief of Journal B without external review because it does not meet the subject matter interest requirement of the journal. Two months later, the author receives a paper with similar subject matter, according to the, to the author, to Donald D, um, from Journal B to review. Donald is furious and writes the ACS CEO and the Joint Board Council Committee Chair demanding the Editor-in-Chief of Journal B be fired. <laughs> Donald also demands that all submitted papers should go out for peer review. How should we handle this case? <laughs> you can even hear him squawk. <laughs> and thoughts? The policy says Editor-in-Chief has says the arbitrary decision. They do. 
But in this particular case, um, is there a smoking gun here with regard to editor or Jess? Because the editor has that, but here's a case where it's similar subject matter. But you don't know who sent it out. Was it the right. associate editor or was it the editor? That's a good question. And how similar are the two papers? Well, how similar are the two papers? So we have this allegation. The question is, is it true? Is there misconduct? Now, in this case, the committee and the ACS staff need to be careful because of editorial freedom right. and because the editor has that prerogative. Um, but they need this ACS and, and staff and, and the committee need to look into the facts and matter. What are the written policies of the journal? Have, have they communicated what what um, is acceptable, what's not acceptable? Is there a policy for what subject matter is appropriate, what is not? Were the two papers handled by the same editor? One the editor in chief, maybe an associate editor, and if that is. How uniform is this, this decision-making process? And that's a question that our committee concerns itself with because we want to make sure that things are done uniformly, fairly, okay? So what are the decision-making procedures? Is there a check and balance? Paul talked about that nothing gets rejected with an internal review unless two of his editors have looked at it. Is there a quality assurance process in place? And that's what I mean is that that do they have that, that check and balance within in order that everyone's on the same page and they know what's acceptable and what's not. So given this information, if the two papers are placed side by side, can an independent party understand why one paper was rejected and the other submitted for review? These are objective things and it, frankly they should be in place and they should be able to communicate them. And it should have been there before we even hear about what this paper is. They should, they should be able to demonstrate that they have these policies. Otherwise, it can come across as arbitrary. In the end, we will not accept or reject paper. We will look at the procedures and we'll try to correct the situation if there's a problem. So the question then is, did, with, given all this, did the process work properly? Is there a systematic problem that needs to be addressed? That's what we would look at. We won't look at that specific paper. The editor has that prerogative. But we can make adjustments and work with that office or with that, with that journal in order to ensure that we don't have these problems. And in the end, whatever the findings are, they need to be explainable to Donald. Okay? So you just can't say, I had, you know, that's my, my prerogative. You need to explain with what the basis of that decision is. Because frankly, this person was at, was rejected, and, or, or Donald in this case, um, had his paper rejected and was asked to review one that had a similar subject. But maybe Donald, maybe, maybe, I don't know what the, what the topic is, but maybe it was, Donald's was, was focused on some nuance and uh, that's only an expert would be interested in. The other one was focused on some issue, it maybe even had the same techniques and the same, same uh, um, um, compounds, but Donald's, or but the other paper was actually looking at a question of chemistry. The one was looking at a, a specific that only an expert would be interested in. The other one may have a general, general issue that, that's being addressed. You know, I don't know, I'm just, you know, this is fiction of so. itself. So anyway, that's, those are two, two cases. And so in summary, I hope I've been able to communicate to you that, that this committee, why this committee exists, that it provides oversight to the editors, the journal content quality, editorial operations. It represents the membership in the scientific communities and publishing news the ACS journals. It really does have a vital role in ensuring the integrity of ACS publications. Its role is ensuring most trusted. Thank you.